So the question before us is whether section 406 and 420 of IPC can be charged together. Or in other words, can a magistrate take cognizance of both the offenses together? Can an accused be tried for both the offenses simultaneously when the cause of action is the same? Or we can rephrase it, can an accused be tried for 406 and 420 simultaneously for the same cause of action, for the same set of facts? The answer is no, because section 406 and 420 are self-exclusive, right? You will get several judgments scattered here and there on Google. Many judgments are there, various judgments of Delhi High Court as well as the Supreme Court. It has been explained that 406 and 420 are mutually exclusive. If one exists, the other cannot. On the same set of facts, for the same cause of action. So how do we explore this? So section 406 prescribes punishment for criminal breach of trust as defined in section 405. So criminal breach of trust is defined in section 405. And when we go through section 405, we see there are the following ingredients of the offense of breach of trust, criminal breach of trust. Number one, a person should have been entrusted with property or with dominion over property. So A, entrusts his property to B, or A, gives B the dominion over his property. Voluntarily. So there is element of voluntariness here. There is element of trust here, but there is no element of dishonesty at the time of entrustment. So here B cannot be said to have dishonest intention at the time when A has voluntarily entrusted this property to B. So the element of dishonesty in criminal breach of trust comes later. It is not at the inception. It is not at the time when the entrustment is being done. So here, the definition must be strictly construed. Right? In criminal law, we do not interpret very widely. In criminal law, when offenses are defined, we have to keep a very conservative interpretation, right? We have to stick to the words and the language, the semantics. So here, at the time of entrustment, there is no element of dishonesty on the part of the party who has been entrusted with it. So a person should have been entrusted with property or with dominion over property. Secondly, that person should dishonestly misappropriate or convert that property to his own use. So converting to his own use means he is acting like an owner of the property, right? As if he were the owner of the property or he utilizes the property dishonestly for his own purpose or dishonestly uses or disposes of that property or willfully suffers any other person so to do. So willfully suffers any other person means makes any other person suffer the loss dishonestly disposes of the property or makes any other person do the same that is dishonestly dispose of the property. So either he instigates someone else to do that dishonestly or he himself dishonestly misappropriates or converts that property to his own use. So can you see here that the element of dishonesty has come subsequent to the act of entrustment. It has come after the act of entrustment has taken place. Here the lawmaker has not anticipated, has not contemplated the element of dishonesty at the time of entrustment. This is very important point and this is where the difference lies. That such misappropriation, conversion, use or disposal should be in violation of any direction of law prescribing the mode in which such trust is to be discharged. So obviously at the time of entrustment, some terms and conditions must have been decided by the settler of the trust, the one who entrusted. So either the trustee, the person to whom the entrustment has been made, violates the direction of law or violates the prescriptions 
violates the terms and conditions mentioned in the trust agreement or whatever may be the mode of agreement he has violated that prescription he has violated that term and condition so here there is dishonesty after entrustment has been done dishonest misappropriation of property has taken place and violation of the terms and conditions set by the settler of the trust or whatever may be the direction of law because there is some law also for example indian trust act so if there is some parliamentary prescription some statutory prescription that has been violated the law has been violated or the terms and conditions settled by the maker of the trust have been violated so in either way dishonest misappropriation is established so in order to attract punishment under section 406 ipc for criminal breach of trust the prosecution must prove number 1 that the accused was entrusted with that property and you can also mark that here the definition starts with the passive voice whereas in case of cheating we will see the definition starts in active voice so that the accused was entrusted with that property or with dominion over property and he dishonestly misappropriated or converted it to his own use or dishonestly used or disposed of it so dishonesty after entrustment this is very important cheating is defined in section 415 the ingredients to constitute an offence of cheating are as follows there should be a fraudulent or dishonest inducement of a person by deceiving him there is a famous saying that a deception that does not deceive is not fraud it's not cheating so here number 1 the person who is accused of cheating should have dishonest intention at the time when the transaction begins so at the beginning itself there should be dishonest intention it starts with fraudulent intention dishonest inducement of a person by deceiving him so at the very beginning at the very commencement of the transaction a has dishonest intention and with dot with that dishonest intention he misrepresents the facts to b and b relying on it as any ordinary man of prudence would rely so b as a reasonable man relies on the misrepresentation dishonestly done by a and hand some property and give some property or is induced to do something that he wouldn't do or induced induced to not to do something that he would have done then we say it is cheating so here the intention to do fraud dishonest inducement is at the very beginning so there should be fraudulent or dishonest inducement of a person by deceiving him that the person so induced should intentionally induce to deliver any property to any person or to consent that any person shall retain any property or the person so induced should be intentionally induced to do or omit to do anything which he would not do or omit if he were not so deceived so it is because of the deception it is because of the misrepresentation dishonest misrepresentation that the other party has done something that he wouldn't have done ordinarily or he has not done something omitted to do something that he would have done in the ordinary course of his actions so it is because of the deception practiced upon him that he hasn't done so it is cheating so in cheating either the property is handed over because of the deception because of the deceiving influence or something is done that shouldn't have been done or something is not done that would have been done anyway so this is cheating so in cases covered by 2b above the act or omission should be one which caused or is likely to cause damage so what mr b because of the deception practiced by a has done is something that is likely to cause harm to him 
something that is likely to cause damage to him, likely to cause injury to his body, mind, reputation or property. So there is deception at the very beginning. There is dishonest element at the very beginning. And because of this deception, the other person behaving like a reasonable man or any reasonable man in his place would have acted like that omits to do something that causes harm to him or that is likely to cause harm to him. Then it is cheating. So here, the main element that I need to emphasize is that dishonesty is at the very beginning. Whereas in case of breach of trust, we saw that dishonesty came later, right? So dishonest intention was a subsequent feeling here, right? There was a feeling of dishonesty subsequent to the act of entrustment. So a fraudulent or dishonest intention is an essential ingredient of the offense of cheating. A person who dishonestly induces another person to deliver any property is liable for the offense of cheating. So what are the ingredients of section 420 that we will see now? A person must commit the offense of cheating under 415, the definition that we have already seen, that dishonest element must be at the very beginning of the transaction. So a person must commit the offense of cheating under section 415 and the person cheated must be dishonestly induced to deliver property to any person or make, alter or destroy valuable security or anything signed on sealed and capable of being converted into valuable security. So the other person who was dishonestly induced to do something, what is that something? Delivering of property or making a valuable security that he wouldn't have made or altering or destroying a valuable security that he wouldn't have done, but he has done and thereby is likely to face some kind of harm or maybe the harm will be the natural consequence of that. So here we say that the accused has committed the offense of cheating. So in case of cheating, we see that the element of dishonesty is the very beginning, whereas in case of breach of trust, the element of dishonesty comes later. So how can the two charges coexist? I emphasized only one point, and that is, when did the element of dishonesty arise? When did the element of dishonesty exist? In the former case, it came into existence after the act of entrustment. In the latter case, it was in existence at the very beginning, at the commencement of the whole transaction, at the inception of the whole transaction. So how can the two coexist? How can something that comes later and something that comes before both coexist? It's impossible. That is why the two charges are mutually exclusive. So the complainant alleged that the accused persons committed the offenses of cheating as well as criminal breach of trust. Okay, a complainant can do so, but it is well settled in law that the accused can be summoned either for cheating or criminal breach of trust. So the judge has to take care of that. And if the judge does not consider this, and in a routine manner, like a clerk in a post office, issues summons where both the charges have been taken into cognizance, then that is illegal. It cannot be done. So it's well settled that the accused cannot be summoned either for cheating or criminal breach of trust and cannot be summoned for both the offenses simultaneously regarding the same cause of action. Same cause of action. Huh, if the causes of actions are different, then yes. It means there will be two trials together, but that's different case. So on the whole, it can be said that an offense under section 406 IPC is an antithesis of offense under section 420 IPC. In a case of criminal misappropriation, the property is voluntarily kept in the custody of an accused, whereas in case of cheating, the accused by adopting deceitful means induces the complainant to part with the property. Thus, an accused cannot be tried for these two offenses simultaneously. Either he has committed an offense under section 406 or under 420. 